Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 International Open Seminar on Semiotics. This is a tribute to John Dealey on the fifth anniversary of his passing. Whether you are watching us live today or enjoying the recording at a later time, we are delighted that you have decided to join us, so thank you. This collaborative international open scientific initiative and celebration is jointly organized by the Institute for Philosophical Studies of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the University of Coimbra, the Lyceum Institute, the Dealey Project, St. Vincent College, the Iranian Society for Phenomenology at the Iranian Political Science Association, the International Association for Semiotics of Space and Time, the Institute for Scientific Information on Social Sciences of the Russian Academy of, the Sci of Sciences, the Semiotic Society of America, the American Maritime Association, the International Association for Semiotic Studies, the International Society for Biosemiotic Studies, the International Center for, Study, uh, for Semiotics and Intercultural Dialogue, Moscow State Academic University for the Humanities and the Mansara Assessa with the support of the Foundation for Sciences and Technology of the Ministry of Science, Technology and Higher Education of the Government of Portugal. So we'd like to thank all of those uh, wonderful institutions that make this seminar possible. Today's lecture will be presented by Dr. Brian Kimple of the Lyceum Institute, and a commentary will be offered by Dr. Matthew Minard. However, a bit of housekeeping notes here. He, uh, due to a last minute scheduling conflict, Dr. Minard will need to record and publish his response at a future time. And it will be made public, um, but it will not be presented live here today. So we'll be looking forward to that as well. Um, those who are with us in the Zoom meeting will be in invited to offer their own commentary and or questions at the end of this lecture as usual. Um, so that enough for housekeeping. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Aquinas, the Metaphysics Behind Semiosis. And it will be delivered um, by Dr. Kempel, Dr. Brian Kempel, as I, as I mentioned. So allow me to go ahead and offer a brief introduction. Dr. Kempel holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas, where he wrote his dissertation under the, uh, the, the one who we're all uh, paying homage to here, John Dealey. He is the uh, founder and executive director of the Lyceum Institute. His philosophical interests and area of study include Thomas Aquinas, John Ponceau, Charles Peirce, Martin Heidegger, as well as the history and importance of semiotics, scholasticism, and phenomenology. He also has other interest in liberal arts, technology, and education as a moral habit. He's published two scholarly books, Ins Primum Cognitum in Thomas Aquinas and the, and the Tradition, that's published by Brill 2017, and uh, uh, The Intersection of Semiotics and Phenomenology, Pierce and Heidegger in Dialogue. He's also uh, published a number of scholarly articles, popular articles, and his own introduction to philosophical principles, logic, physics, and the human person, as well as uh, linguistic signification, a classic course in grammar and composition. In addition to being the executive director of the Lyceum Institute, he is the executive editor of Reality, a journal for a philosophical discourse. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Kempel. Dr. Kempel, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your lecture. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, thank you, William, and Robert, and everyone else who's uh, making this possible. Uh, my presentation today will be a little bit on the technical side, and so I do have a PowerPoint that I will uh, bring up on the screen here. And uh, let's see, hopefully you all can, can see this. Um, put it into uh, maybe a slideshow format. <clears throat> okay, 
So uh, the name Thomas Aquinas does not ordinarily receive prominent billing within the history of semiotics. Certainly one hears the name spoken often in halls of theology and respected in discussions philosophical, even if perhaps begrudgingly by some atheists. But Thomas Aquinas wrote no treatise on signs, provided no great apparent innovation in their definition, and ostensibly added no weighty conceptual distinctions to help us navigate their functioning. And one might, in reading those limited and often incidentally sign-related comments of his own, believe that his was merely faithful adherence to the Augustinian presentation. Between Augustine and John Ponceau, therefore, St. Thomas seems perhaps an important clarifier for the whole philosophical project, a channel for Aristotelianism, but not a direct contributor to the understanding of what a sign is. Even John Dealey in his 400 page medieval philosophy redefined, which is an expanded account of the Latin age of philosophy as presented first in the four ages of understanding. Even this great and insightful work gives a scant nine pages to considering Aquinas' treatment of signs, much of which concerns developments made by his followers, especially, of course, John Ponceau, and does not spend much time on St. Thomas's own explicit thought. In Dealey's words, Aquinas exhibits a kind of schizophrenia in his treatment of the sign, for which the insight of John Ponceau is necessary to resolve. Indeed, as Ponceau himself writes, in order to make clear the mind of St. Thomas on this question, one must reckon with the fact that sometimes he speaks of a sign precisely as it exercises the office of representing another besides itself. And in this way of speaking, he concedes to the formal sign, the rationale of a sign simply. At other times, St. Thomas speaks of signs which, as things objectified and first known, lead us to something signified. And this usage, and in this usage, he teaches that a sign is principally found in sensible things and not in spiritual things, which are less manifest to us. But to view Aquinas strictly through the anachronistic and explicitly semiotic lens of the present, or indeed in some way even of any thinker who succeeded him, mistakes the crucial role that his thought plays in the development of a doctrina signorum. To explain my meaning here, I wish to recall the conclusion of my previous lecture for the International Open Seminar, that concerning St. Augustine's contribution and deficiency in founding this doctrina signorum for the Latin age. Drawing primarily upon Augustine's De Magistro, we saw there that despite his recognition of signs ubiquity in our lives, Augustine nevertheless relegated the action of signs to sensory modalities of being alone. Thus, per Augustine, signs are integral for our functioning in the physical world, and therefore inestimably useful in navigating our terrestrial existence, but nevertheless remain extrinsic and incidental to our mental lives to the life that is of the interior man, the really real life for a human being. This reduction of the sign to the sensory and its exclusion from our interior lives produces a discontinuous and fragmented account of human knowledge and experience and renders thereby communication between human persons and the world, including other human persons whom we encounter within this world, renders thereby communication an inscrutable mystery. Behind this posit of divided human experience, one sees the Neoplatonic metaphysics through which the soul and body, integral to Augustine's philosophical thought, are understood respectively to be participated and participator. For any adherent of such a metaphysics, it appears impossible that the body and the sensible could affect any change in the soul, could in any way be a cause to the soul's activity. Matter having existence only from participation in the spiritual that alone possesses reality. Of course, here we enter upon certain issues of the relation between matter and form into which we'll not have time to fully go today. 
But nevertheless, by contrast, we can see that Thomas Aquinas, without repudiating the Neoplatonic conception of participation, and while accepting the traditional Augustinian definition of the sign, at least in a certain respect, nevertheless grasped and expounded the richer and more coherently explanatory doctrine of act and potency posited by Aristotle, and thereby Aquinas illuminated the continuity of sense and intellect in our coming to know, and most poignantly for our purposes in this open seminar, articulated why the intellect itself operates through the use of signs, though admittedly we must reconstruct this articulation ourselves. At the outset of this inquiry, therefore, there are two specific texts to which I wish to draw attention, as I believe they are key in understanding St. Thomas's contribution to semiotics, both texts from the Questiones Disputate de Veritate. First, in question 11, article one, response to the fourth objection, Aquinas writes, it is from sensitive signs which are received in the sensitive faculties that the intellect grasps intelligible intentions which it uses for producing knowledge within itself. And second, in question four, article one, response to the seventh objection, he states, the interior word possesses the rationale of signification more properly than does the exterior word, because the exterior word is not instituted for the, purposes, for the purpose of signifying, except through the interior word. Well, if I may abruptly switch focus for a moment, it seems to me that the fundamental attractiveness of semiotics consists in the sign's ability to unite the objects of our inquiry and experience. It is no accident that Charles Sanders Peirce espoused his own metaphysical doctrine as cynicism, the essential continuity of all things, a philosophy of being without any gaps. Dualism he repudiated as the philosophy that makes its analyses with an X, leaving as the ultimate elements unrelated chunks of being. It is my belief that anyone who fails to grasp the relations of act and potency in the process of human cognition will fall sooner or later into just such a dualism. For one will not be able to understand semiosis as the action of signs. That is, if semiosis is the action of signs and semiotics, the study of the action of signs, can we really claim to understand semiosis if we do not first understand how signs act and if we do not understand act itself? The action of the sign in its broadest extension, comprising not only those cognitive and cathectic operations proper to the human being, but also to non-human animals, plants, and even in some way inorganic beings, requires the most complex explanation for it requires of us that we speak of many things that are far removed from our own experience. But even at the most familiar, that is even within the activity of our own personal experience, the action of the sign is yet quite difficult to explain. If we are to understand why and how, the action of the sign provides the anti-dualistic unification that makes it so attractive in principle, we must grasp a metaphysics of action and specifically a metaphysics of cognitive action. To this, there is no better guide than St. Thomas Aquinas. And as we will see in this lecture, there's a connection between the rationale of signification, the ratio significationis, and the intentionality of our concepts, which illumines the way towards understanding this action of signs. In this lecture, therefore, we will proceed through three steps. First, we will give an abbreviated exposition of Aquinas' metaphysics of act and potency, which he inherited from Aristotle. Second, we will just demonstrate as succinctly as possible how this applies to the psychology of cognition. And third, we will explore the ratio significationis and the verba mentis. In conclusion, we will point to the triadic relativity implicit in Aquinas' own understanding of truth and knowledge. 
Part one, act and potency. No doubt I have, as usual, set myself here far too ambitious of a task to explain not only act and potency, but how they explain our cognitive operations is the task not of half an hour, but half a year. Nevertheless, it is quite reasonable to say that absent some understanding of these principles, I don't think we can understand much, or perhaps even anything, of what St. Thomas has to tell us about the work of signs, or the work of cognition. This exposition, moreover, will be pertinent to a lecture given later this year concerning John Ponceau. So, what is ACT? I'll not belabor here the standard expository points, and instead summarize. Namely, that act and potency are primary notions which divide being as the first of all concepts. That the word act signifies what is, and the word potency signifies in some manner what could be. That the word form signifies a principle of action, and matter signifies a principle of potency. And that it is through the motions and changes of forms within matter that we first encounter act and potency. Much as it would profit us to consider these notions exhaustively, it would not profit you, nor me, to sit here listening to me until Monday morning, or for me to run horse attempting to say everything which needs to be said. Moreover, one may find expositions of these principles in the De Principis Naturae, De Ante et Essentia, and in odd corners of Aquinas's commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, in frequent places throughout the Summa Theologia and Summa Contra Gentiles, the Questiones Disputate de Potentia Dei, and of course in the commentaries on both the physics and the metaphysics. In fact, one can hardly read a few pages in St. Thomas without coming across some interesting discussion of how act and potency are exhibited in the objects of our experience and contemplation. And so instead here, I wish to consider certain divisions of act so as to help us better identify the action which is characteristic of the sign. Such will, of course, require us also to take into consideration certain notions of potency, inasmuch as the act of anything finite necessarily occurs in correspondence with some potency. And so first, Aquinas provides a succinct summary exposition of these two principles in the first article of his Questiones Disputate de Potentia Dei. Here, he begins by clarifying the meaning of potentia when it is said in the sense of power, as we more regularly think of that term, that is, the ability to cause effects. And he exposits here, this power is derived from the primacy of act. As we read, potency is said to be from act. Now act is twofold, namely first act, which is the form, and second act, which is operation. And thus it seems that from the understanding that was common to humans, the word act was first attributed to operation, for it as, is as such that all understand act. And secondarily, from this the word was transferred to form, inasmuch as form is the principle and end of operation. Wherefore, and similarly, Potency is twofold. One active sense to which corresponds the act of which is operation. And it is to this sense that the word potency seems to have been first attributed, that is power as we ordinarily think of it. And the second sense of passive potency, to which corresponds the first act which is form, to which it seems similarly that the name of potency was secondarily extended. Well, we are thus here given two senses of act, that of operation, or what we might call more commonly action, or second act, and that of form. We are also given two sentences of potency, that which is active, or which has a power in itself, a power to operate, and that which is passive, which receives the effect of another's power. The active potency is that whereby a thing operates, such that the active power regards its object as the terminus of operation, 
And the passive power is that whereby something receives a form, that is the effect of power from another, which occurs through the operation of some distinct active potency, which is to say that the passive potency regards its object as the stimulus of action. Now, from these considerations, it is clear that there is a certain metaphysical hierarchy in which passive potency, operation, and active potency are all referred somehow to form as primary. For form is the principle and end of operation, and as Aquinas explains thoroughly in commenting upon Book 9 of Aristotle's Metaphysics, passive potency always reduces existentially to active potency. But otherwise, whatever we know as passive is known insofar as it corresponds in a certain proportion to something active, and vice versa, we discover the actualities of things in as much as they exhibit a certain proportion to the passive. Now second, to elaborate on the relations of the active and passive potencies. An active potency is a certain capacity following from the actuality possessed by a being according to its substantial form. That is, according to what it is essentially in itself through which it is able to operate. A passive potency is a certain capacity to receive from the operation of an active potency of something insofar as it is other, while the possession of a passive potency in that which receives from another is itself something that likewise flows from the substantial form. Passive potency is, in other words, a consequence of a substantial form that leaves the substance somehow open to further determinations. Absent the grounding actuality of some form, there would be no passive potency to speak of. Further, absent the operation of an active potency, which potency is other than the passive potency, the passive potency will never be brought to its proper actuality. While a passive potency may be chronologically prior in the constitution of some particular being, it is always ontologically posterior to the operation of that active potency, which operation is itself dependent on the enduring actuality of the active potency, which itself is further dependent on the enduring actuality of the substantial form of the being itself. Thus, we know a thing to be in act inasmuch as we can say that it is that thing, as we understand that thing to be, and conversely know the potencies of things inasmuch as we see them through their proportion to their corresponding actualities. As I said, this is gonna be a technical presentation. Now, third, the proportionate relation of operations to potencies are further of two kinds namely what are called transitive and imminent actions. Though it is important we not be deceived as we might easily be about the reality which is signified by this latter term. Transitive actions are easier understood and so let's begin there. A transitive act is any wherein the perfection of the form produced by the operation resides in something outside the agent operating. All our acts of artistry, for instance, are transitive actions. Clearly in the plastic arts, such as painting or sculpture, where the action is undertaken for the sake of the painting made or the sculpture sculpted, and somewhat more opaquely, but nevertheless still truly, in the pattern of display, which is characteristic of performance arts. So we might be improved in our own being through making a chair, but this improvement is incidental to the act of making itself. For we make a chair principally in order to make a chair. Likewise, the performance of a dance may do many good things for the virtues of the dancer, but it is for the sake of the performance that one dances. Conversely, an imminent action, so-called, is one where the perfection resides in the agent who operates. It fulfills the being of which it is an action. 
even if it may subsequently in some way result in some further transitive action. Such an imminent act is more perfect in itself than any transitive action, since the transitive action is for the sake of that into which the actuality is transferred, while the imminent action is a perfection of the being within which it exists. Now, there are many mistakes easily made, and so warned against here, in understanding the nature of these two kinds of action. So first, I think one into which is easily slid is to think that operations are transitive actions and forms are imminent actions, and that that division is exhaustive and fully uh, explanatory for the kinds of actions under consideration here. Second, one might think that imminent operation is constrained to being an affect solely of the subjective being in question, as though the actuality brought into being thereby is purely and entirely confined within the corporeal limits of the substance to which it belongs. And third, one might mistakenly think that imminent actions belong to passive and transitive actions to active potencies, respectively. In truth, Imminent actions can be operations, and they can be, when they are imminent operations of active potencies, relationally constituted, and therefore, in a certain way, exceed the being of that subject in which they are actual. Thus, the imminent operations of our cognitive and appetitive faculties can best be understood not as constrained within us, but as really uniting us with their objects, at least in a certain respect, that is, according to a different mode of existence, as we will see momentarily. Now, among living beings, there are, I would say, no imminent operations of non-living beings. There are no imminent operations of active potencies. Neither any change which occurs among the non-living is the result of a transitive operation initiated from without. And any operation of the non-living is transitive and ordered to something other. The atom is what it is, and anything changed within it occurs through some physical dyadic relation of an operation extrinsic to the recipient, something which acts upon a passive potency. Conversely, living beings admit a gradation of imminent operations through which the beings seek their specific ends. Now, there's much more to say, one, much more one ought to say. And perhaps a better presenter than myself would find a sufficiently succinct way to say, in fact, much more about the diverse realization of act in living and non-living beings precisely insofar as they are or are not alive, as well as about the establishment and growth of habit and the relation between habits and potencies, both active and passive. But for my sadly limited talents, and more importantly for our limited time and specific purpose in this lecture, it must suffice to say that there's a kind of unique indetermination, which is care characteristic of the active and passive potencies which belong to the human being, an indetermination which makes the intellectual soul both highly dependent upon the passive potencies it has with respect to the extramental world, and yet itself capable of acting with a kind of universal extension. In other words, the passive and active potencies diversely realized their transitive and imminent actions upon the human being and from the human being result in our being related somehow to everything. Or in Aristotle's succinct way of putting it, the soul is in some way all things. Well, narrowing our focus, therefore, to the faculties of the human beings let us now move on to part two of the lecture, Cognitive Potencies and Actions. With this narrowed focus, I believe we can discern readily that the faculties of the human being collectively function 
in a complex dynamic, a dynamic of action and passion, of active and passive potencies. Indeed, in Aquinas's phrase, we abound in a diversity of powers. Our sense faculties are passive. They are moved or stimulated by their objects, such as to thereby be brought into actuality themselves. I do not, I cannot see in the absence of light, nor can I hear in the absence of some vibration. And yet, despite the transitive activity of light and auditory vibration upon my sense organs, the actions engendered therein do not result in my organs becoming themselves just as the objects sensed are themselves. My eyes do not truly become blue themselves when a blue light is seen, nor do my ears become an electric motor when hearing the sound of one. My fingertip is not made rough by a single touch of sandpaper. And yet, my sense faculties do, in some manner, become those objects. This becoming without becoming, as Aquinas explains in commenting upon Aristotle's perisuke, or de anima, is the reception of form without matter, which is to say the reception of form in alio modo esse, in another mode of existence. As he writes, sometimes the form is received into the patient according to a different mode of existence than it has in the agent. Because the material disposition of the patient for receiving is not alike to the material disposition which is in the agent. And therefore, the form is received into the patient without matter insofar as the patient is assimilated to the agent according to form and not according to matter. And it is in this mode that the sense receives form without matter, because the form has one mode of existing in the sense and another in the thing sensed. For in the thing sensed, it has a natural existence, while in the sense, it has an intentional and spiritual existence. Well, the meaning of this esse intentionale, or spiritual existence, which latter term Aquinas primarily uses, befits a nice thick fat monograph. Suffice it here to say that Aquinas uses it not to signify what exists in a realm separate from the corporeal, but rather these actualities of our own experience which are not bodily themselves which do not have a thing that we can reach out and touch and point. This alio modo esse, the intentional or spiritual, opens up the first world within which there can be exercised any semiotic freedom, such that a being possessing its objects intentionally becomes more than merely itself, becomes in a potential manner infinite, or put otherwise, the act of sensation opens up a kind of indeterminate manner of relating between the animal and its objects, a manner that can always become something more. This essay intentionale opens up a realm of absolute indeterminacy, an indeterminacy that can change ad infinitum. This opening into indetermination through the act of sensation can be seen more fully in that we do not simply sense as purely passive beings, but rather we perceive. And indeed, most of what we consider, most of what we talk about as sensation is in truth perception. For perception consists in not only the passive receptivity of impressions, but a certain active corresponding objectivization of what acts upon the passive potencies of sensation. In other words, we regard the objects of, of perception, excuse me, not merely as stimuli, but also as termini. And so the intentional existence of the form received without matter 
is one which constitutes a relational structure between the perceiver and the perceived, a structure defined by both the fundament from which and the terminus to which it is ordered. Thus, we perceive sensed things as objects of a certain kind, which as an interpretive framing constituted by actions of the perceptual faculties themselves, therefore requires activity, an active potency, or even a set of active potencies. For these perceived objects are, as interpreted beings in that being interpreted, incidental in a certain way to what is directly and immediately sensible to what is received through that stimulation. And it is on this incidental basis that the objects are evaluated as to whether the animal ought to seek or avoid or ignore them. We don't avoid something because it is white. We avoid it because it's a white lion. And so it is to these perceptually objectivizing and evaluating operations that Aquinas ascribes the cogitative faculty. To this belong a multitude of operations, far more complex than most scholars of St. Thomas himself even seem to realize, including the constitution of phantasmal representations, or we might say representamens, through which are made present to the mind objects of an individual constitution. Now, in both the case of sensation and perception, the passive reception of some form without its matter and the active constitution of the representation of an individual object, in both cases, the action itself is something imminent. Each is a kind of becoming the object by its own proper mode of action, which in each case is a representative action, the action of an essay intentionale. But as Dealey made ubiquitously clear in his writings upon St. Thomas, there is a unique way in which the human being relates to its objects, namely as more than merely objects. The human being relates to objects as beings, as being, which is to say, as things in their own right. This too is by a certain intentional existence. And it is here precisely, I believe, that we discover how Aquinas's metaphysics play a crucial role in the development of the proto-semiotics that culminates in John Ponceau. The relations of acts and potencies in the constitution of intellectual understanding are complex not only in themselves, but textually as well. As an aside, such is the subject explored in the third and longest chapter of my doctoral dissertation written under Gilly on ens primum cognitum in Thomas Aquinas and the tradition. But in sum, we may say that the active potency of the perceptual faculties constitutes a relation with objects through a phantasm which phantasm is itself alike to the intellect as the darkened visible object is to the eyes. And thus it is a kind of specified or designated material cause we might say for the operation of the intellect. For upon this darkened phantasm is shed the light of the intellectus agens, which illumination belongs to its operation resulting in the formation of a species, a specifying form, which is received into the intellectus possibilis. This species, in turn, is elaborated upon and results in the formation of the verbum mentis, which, in being and becoming actual, results in the imminent operation of understanding an operation which is itself a kind of essay intentionale. And Aquinas explains this in a highly technical passage in his Quad Libital Questions, from which I will now read. And I apologize because I meant to put this on a slide, it being such a technical passage, but forgot. So I'll be happy to share it later. At any rate, Aquinas writes, there is a twofold operation of the intellect 
according to Aristotle in Book 3 of the De Anima, one which is called the understanding of indivisibles, through which the intellect forms in itself a definition or in-complex concept. The other is the operation of the understanding which composes and divides, according to which it forms enunciations. And each of these, constituted through the operation of the intellect, and of each of these, there is something called a word of the heart, a verbum cordis, the first of which is signified through an incomplex term, the second signified through a statement. Now it is manifest that every operation of the intellect proceeds from that according to which it is made to be an act through an intelligible specifying form, because nothing operates except insofar as it is an act itself. Thus it is necessary that the intelligible specifying form, which is the principle of intellectual operation, differs from the word of the heart, which is formed through the operation of the understanding. Although that word is also able to be called a form or intelligible specification, but in just the same manner uh, of intellectual constitution that a form of art, which the intellect invents, is able to be called an intelligible specification. Now it's this among other texts, which gives rise to the distinction made by later Thomists in the tradition between impressed and expressed species, as we will see in John Ponceau in a later lecture. But here we also see that dynamic relation within the intellect itself in terms of act and potency, whereby there is constituted the verbum cordis or mentis. And now we may turn to understand how this interior word realizes the action of signs. Part three, the ratio significationis and the verbal mentis. Now, as Dealey demonstrates in his medieval philosophy redefined, Aquinas' struggle with the essence of the sign consists in a certain recognition, almost in passing, as it were, that Augustine's definition is inadequate. And yet, given his strong respect for the tradition, as well as his discussions of signs always occurring in the service of some other issue. Given these points, he does not interject a newly stipulated signification for the word sign. And even therefore in reading carefully those passages where the being of the sign comes under explicit, albeit brief consideration, we might be fairly easily confused by what Aquinas has to say. And so in an effort to bring forth some clarity on these texts and to add to what Dealey has already elucidated, I wish to look at a series of texts taken from Aquinas' writings. We will begin by tracing the route of those texts, which Dealey has in his aforementioned exposition. But beyond what Dealey has shown us, I wish to point to how Aquinas' metaphysics of act and potency allow us an understanding of communication not only as a matter of encoding and decoding messages from one individual to another, but as we will ultimately see, as a matter of growth in being through this intentional existence. So the first text comes from the De Veritate, question nine, article four, in response to the fourth objection. And here Aquinas, who is considering whether angels may be said to speak to one another, and in particular, whether they make use of signs. Aquinas here writes, although it is the case that among natural things, the effects of which are better known to us than their causes, the sign is posterior in nature. Nevertheless, the intelligible rationale of the sign does not properly consist in being posterior or prior in nature, but only in being prior in our cognition. Whence, sometimes we take effects as signs of causes, as the pulse is a sign of health, and other times we take causes as signs of effects, 
as the dispositions of the heavenly bodies to be signs of storms and rain. But what's important, what's crucial in this text for our purposes is that the intelligible rationale of the sign does not consist in priority or posteriority in nature, but only in priority in cognition. This priority in cognition entails that sensibility as such is not integral to the rationale of being a sign. And in both the examples which Aquinas gives, the pulse as a sign of health and the clouds as a sign of impending weather, the signification manifestly requires an inference on the part of the one to whom the object is signified in order that it be an object at all. In other words, it's not the sign simply stated, this thing called a sign here, the pulse or the clouds, but it's the knowledge of those things which makes them to be signs and therefore makes there to be objects which are signified by them. The second text which we wish to examine comes just before this in the response to the previous objection. There, St. Thomas writes, the word sign, properly speaking, cannot be said of something unless one cognitively proceeds from it to something other by a process of discursive reasoning. And according to this, signs are not in the angels, since their knowledge is not discursive, as was shown in the preceding question. And accordingly, signs in our experience are sensible things, because our cognition, which is discursive, arises from sensible things. But commonly speaking, we are able to call a sign anything which by being grasped itself makes something else to be known. And according to this common way of speaking, an intelligible form is able to be called a sign of that which is grasped through it. Thus the angels grasp things through signs, such that one angel speaks to another through a sign, namely through the specifying form in which the understanding of one is rendered perfectly in ordination to another. As Daly writes of this passage, it seems a bit backwards, as though proprio loquenda means loosely speaking, while communitaire means from the point of view of a scientific consideration of the matter. I think we can see here, without Aquinas mentioning it explicitly, that rising, growing tension of his own understanding of a sign and of the action of a sign, in contrast to the Augustinian definition, which restricts the sign to the sensible. And the tension is drawn tighter by the third text, which comes also from the De Veritate, in the first question, or first article of the fourth question, response to objection seven. There we read, the intelligible rationale of a sign belongs primarily to the effect rather than to the cause when the cause is the cause of the effect being or existing, but not of its signifying, as in the example given, that is of a tag attached to a jar signifying it to hold a certain wine. But when the effect has from the cause, not only the fact that it is, but also that it signifies, then, as the cause is prior to the effect in being, likewise in the signifying. And therefore, the interior word possesses the rationale of signification more properly than does the exterior word, because the exterior word is not instituted for the purpose of signifying except through the interior word. Well, it's at this point that the verbum interius, also called in many places the verbum cordis, as we've already seen, or verbum mentis, more properly possesses the rationale of signification, the ratio significationis, which is confirmed and reconfirmed repeatedly over and over again in the texts of St. Thomas. You can find it even as early as in his commentary on the sentences, in the Summa Theologia, and his commentaries on scripture, over and over and over again, we find this point stated. So how do we reconcile this assertion that the interior word more properly possesses the rationale of signification than the exterior word, 
and indeed that it is even more properly called a word than the exterior word is, with a previously cited claim that proprio loquendo signs are sensible things. It may ostensibly appear an irresoluble textual difficulty, but I believe a resolution is in fact quite simple. Namely, that as Thomas uses these terms, the ratio significationis names one thing and signum names another. The latter in Aquinas' use names a thing, an object, something which as an object brings the ratio significationis into being. While the former, the ratio significationis itself, names the action of the sign. Or to put this in other words, Aquinas has here implicitly distinguished between the sign vehicle and the sign relation. For the intelligible rationale of signification consists in any one thing making present a second to some third by an imminent operation in a cognoscitive faculty. But the name signum has been given to the effect rather than to the cause, and thus, conventionally, it is said proprio loquendo of those things, those sensible things, which lead the mind from one thing to another rather than to the cause. The cause here being the ratio significationis itself, the ratio significationis in act, and here most specifically, the operation of the intellect and understanding through the constitution of the verbum mentis. To put this otherwise, St. Thomas certainly does not produce a theory of the sign as we recognize it today. After the insights and discussion of John Ponceau, Charles Peirce, and John Dealey are given to us for such illumination. And yet the elements remain present nonetheless. I think just beneath the surface, if we understand what is meant by the action of the sign, namely that making manifest something other than itself to a cognoscitive faculty by an imminent operation at least in the case of human beings, an imminent operation that is the object in esse intentionale. Now, to conclude, as a final point, I wish to exhibit the centrality of this metaphysical consideration to St. Thomas's theory of truth. This theory, as is well known, is discussed in the first article of the first question in the Questiones Disputate de Veritate. But there, I believe a certain anachronistic reading has miscolored precisely what it is that Aquinas is saying, even to the point of his Latin being horrifically and confusingly mistranslated into English in the widely available English translation. Now, I'm not going to subject you all to a reading of my own translation in entirety, but it is often stated that Aquinas there gives three definitions for truth and describes a principal place to the second often called a correspondence theory, which posits that truth consists in the adequation of intellect and thing. But when Aquinas defines truth in this article, he doesn't do so in three separate definitions. Rather, he defines truth in a threefold modality, which three necessarily hang together, of which the second provides the formal rationale but the formal rationale doesn't exist apart from the other two. And so I do ask that you indulge me for at least a moment as I quote an adumbrated version of the most relevant passage. As Aquinas writes, in the first mode, truth is defined according to that which precedes the intelligible rationale of truth and in which the true is founded. And in the second mode, Truth is defined according to that which formally perfects the intelligible rationale of the true. And thus, Isaac says that truth is the adequation of thing and intellect. And Anselm, truth is rectitude perceptible by the mind alone. For this rectitude is said to be according to a certain adequation, according to which Aristotle says that in defining truth, we say something to be what it is or not to be what it is not. And in the third mood, the true is defined according to the effect following possession of the adequation, and thus Hillary gives the definition that the true is that which manifests and declares existence, and Augustine, truth is that by which that which is, is shown, and truth is that according to which we judge of inferior things. 
well, comprised within this threefold definition, I believe we can see the triadic relation of a sign as constituting intellectual understanding. The object, that is, which is what is disclosed by the representamen, by means of which an adequation is made between intellect or the interpretant and the intelligible reality of the thing, such that the intellect is able to judge of individuals, inferior things, by its knowledge of that intelligible reality. And so it is in line with the aforementioned Senecistic metaphysics purse that it seems appropriate to say semiosis is essentially a resolutive process. That is the realization of any third governing two firsts as seconds to one another is a kind of synthetic reality. In non-living beings, that reality does not resolve into a greater actuality of the firsts themselves. And in beings other than the human, such as the animal, which is uh, the human, which is the animal that not only makes use of signs, but is aware that it makes use of signs, that actuality is of a purely reflexive kind, plants and, and non-human animals, I think. And so the uniqueness with which the verbum mentis as something uniquely human, the uniqueness with which it possesses the ratio significationis, consists in that actually universal comprise, that it seizes not merely the object as object, but the object as thing, and therefore in a manner which is illimitable by the constitution of the agent. The consequence redounds to the agent in opening it to the entire universe. The reality synthesized in this relation is in a certain respect, as Aquinas says, all things. The soul of the intellectual agent is the other, becoming the intelligible in and through the intention which is provenated by the concept, provenated by the verbum mentis. The Augustinian gap between world and mind, between the outer and inner human person, is a gap that has plagued many philosophical approaches. It is a gap of being and non-being, a gap that I would argue runs throughout modern philosophical thinking as well, from Descartes through Husserl and into their continued adherence today. What we see by contrast with Thomas Aquinas is approach an approach that, though incomplete in itself, illustrates the fundamental continuity of the world of things and of the world of the mind through the action of signs. There's much more to discover yet in how the metaphysical thought of Thomas Aquinas illuminates this action of signs. I can only hope that this presentation lays a certain foundation on which we can continue to build in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kempel. That was, uh, that was a great presentation. At uh, this time, um, I think we're going to close the live broadcast. But for those of you who are here in Zoom, we will open the floor to uh, questions and or comments.